So I started with a grandiose title, A New World Order and a Need for a Technological University. First I'd lay out my stall by saying, the technolo technological university is not something that is designed to squeeze in between the traditional universities and the IOTs in a way that nobody gets upset and nobody loses their core area of interest. A technological university is there because the world in which we live in and the changing world and rapidly changing world requires a new form of educational system. Ireland is the most open economy in the world. We have to trade in a world economy. Our industries and our educational system has to compete in that economy. And the message I'm giving here are two messages. One is that the technological university is one of the drivers for the continued development of Ireland and the Irish economy. It is, as Ellen said, not simply a tool for economic development. It is much more complex than that, but is part of an ecosystem, a very important ecosystem, which is important to our future growth and survival. And I'll start by talking about the information society. It's interesting that we're all very comfortable with the term information society, and it's become ingrained in the way we look at our environment. And yet, it is less, it is just over 20 years old. So I put some key, if you like, uh, uh, dates and, uh, and, and three key uh, technological um, advances which created the information society. So the internet, it's only since 1995 that it actually carried commercial traffic. It's hard to believe, it's so much part of our life. The World Wide Web is from 1990, and wireless 3G mobile is from the 1990 to 3G. When I used to go, I started uh, working in research and the European Framework Program in, 1880, in 1989, <laughs> 1889. I am slightly younger than that. Um, but when we used to leave to go to Brussels or go to uh, a, a Paris or where, whatever, people couldn't contact you. You were gone. If they knew what hotel you were in, they could leave you a message. Can you imagine that now? Can you? My son couldn't imagine that, right? He's 20 this year. That would be un unbelievable for him. So the information society is new, but it has transformed our society in a way that we could never have dreamt of. So what is the next transformation? We cannot dream of that either. So we live in a connected world, and in the connected world, it has redefined distance and time. So we all know that if you have, for instance, you want to ring Sky because you have a problem with your system, you're probably talking to somebody in India. There's a company in uh, Carlo that monitors uh, nuclear power stations in New York. So distance and time. We, we can all shop 24 hours a day if we have the money. But the main thing is, you, if you go online, you have no idea where the warehouse is. You have no idea where the shop is. It's a virtual world. And that's the second thing, a virtual world. For our students here, their virtual world is their real world, Facebook, right? They use the virtual world to communicate, they create friendships, they create uh, communities in the virtual world. And this redefines a sense of place and community. And this is important for education because this is a physical building. And sometimes we think we bring the students in here and that this is where they do their learning. This is only a very small part of that learning community. My own son decided on which university he was going to go to, not because of what was on in the RDS and the information he got. It was through Facebook and listening to what other students say. And we all know that, that if we have a poor lecturer here, we cannot protect him because his students will put it on Facebook and other students will look at that and make decisions, right? So that is the way we're judged, this virtual, community, this virtual world is as real as the real world we live in. And the, that is the future, the convergence of the real and the virtual world, okay? The internet, which started as a plaything, as something to allow uh, academics to communicate, 
I would do most of my research in what's called the future internet. Europe is a big, big program on future internet. The key message between the about the future internet is that the internet now is a critical infrastructure. If I say to you e-health, it has an understanding for you, it has a residence for you, okay? E-banking. So what we now have is we have a world where the virtual and the real coexist. We have a world where everything we do is digitized in some way. But the most important thing about it is that we as, uh, particularly in the engineering and the science area, right, that, that we as academics, the world is changing so rapidly around us for our students and we are trying to teach to them about what that world is about, about the fundamentals from a scientific view and the engineering that creates that uh, view. The reality is that, any, that all of our students, within five years of graduating here, they will have to completely re-educate themselves to understand the world that they will live in and to contribute to that world as engineering and scientists and also people from humanities. Because the other thing is, the internet was about technology. It's equally now about design and usability as it is about engineering. And that is one of the points Ellen was saying, the multidisciplinarity of the environment we're in and the type of research we need to do in that environment. So what's the implication for us as educators? What's the implication for our community of what we, we do here? Because one of the things, and I'll be provocative, right? One of the things I heard somebody say was, the reason we have to, haven't made a decision on whether we want to be a technological university or not is because we want to protect the terms and conditions. The world is changing. The terms and conditions and the way we work here is changing at a rate that is really 20 years ago we couldn't dream of, okay? And we have to, as professionals, as, as intellectuals, move with that changing world, okay? So the first thing is, our students are part of a global community. One of my friends, when they got a, uh, a, uh, the internet uh, installed, discovered one of his, uh, his sons was up at three o'clock in the morning playing, playing video games with people in Boston. That's his community. He didn't have to introduce himself. He didn't have to go through the normal, hi, I'm this. They play in a common world. Second thing is, we're organized and judged through that community. I can guarantee you that if we fail here and fail our students, that information will be communicated through Facebook and through other similar uh, uh, um, virtual networks. And that's how we'd be judged. And that's how students will decide whether to come in here. <laughs> Lifelong learning is the norm. If you have to change completely your uh, skill set every five years, then when you move, leave this building with a primary degree, that is only the beginning. And that changes the type of students we're going to have. And believe you me, as you all know, if you actually teach mature students, they do not accept second rate teaching. And they will communicate that very quickly, okay? And also the way we, te we have to teach is going to change. New knowledge delivery mechanisms. We need to use the technology that's there to communicate in the new world. So in, this, in, 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 for instance, standing in front of a classroom, which again goes back to the 18 hours, the biggest problem about the 18 hours is that somebody in the Department of Education or elsewhere believes that the only thing you do here is stand in front of your students for 18 hours to teach them. If education was so easy, right? There are so many other things, and particularly when technology is changing so rapidly. New learning patterns, multimodal ways of, of, of teaching. Disruptive technologies are, are driving social change. All of the most important companies that are here today were not here 20 years ago. And when I was in California recently, and uh, there was a conference on the future of the internet, somebody made a statement that Amazon and Google is the past, that they will not survive the next 10 years. Could you believe that? Why? Because the technology that is coming is undermining 
the business models that they have. And the simple example is, Google, you do a search, right? So you want to find out where's the best hotel, where's, where, uh, where should I eat? The app and the way app, uh, applications are developed in mobile applications means that now people download the app onto the phone and go directly to that information without going through Google. Google makes its money by selling advertising. If people are not using Google, then the advertisers don't want to go there. And that's, that was the statement. So it's just a little example of how things are changing, right? So we need new stakeholder models for this, for, the, for this world. And we need a policy of staff improvement. It's very expensive. Nobody actually discusses this. Industry, if they want to uh, provide new skills for their staff, they can pay to bring in trainers. We can't do that. We don't have the money, OK? So the practical thing is, if so I leave you the question, right? If society is changing so rapidly, how do our own staff upscale and respond to that, OK? By the way, the last point is the most important one. It's one of the things that annoys me. It annoys me particularly about the national debate. We are a regional institute. What does that mean? What, what's a regional institute? We're an open economy. If I deal with a company in Waterford, Genzyme, or an SME, their needs are exactly the same as everywhere else. So the only thing I accept as the concept of a regional institute is that we bring the world to the region, to benefit the region, to society in this region. I have a little bit of a problem with the idea of regional as something kind of second rate or something that doesn't need as much as if you happen to be in, in, in Dublin or one of the bigger cities. If we look at research and how research is changing, here's two examples. In the, in the biopharma area, right, there's decreased uh, revenue from declining productivity. One of the biggest problems that they have is that drugs coming out of patent. So this, between 2011 and 2012, the value of the drugs coming out is 42 billion euros huge amount and for most of those companies that's a huge revenue loss that they cannot reinvest into research so what's happened in the biopharma company uh, industry is they've refocused the industry to a collaborative industry where a lot of the big biopharma companies are funding research in the universities in the states everybody said that's a brilliant idea that's great really good for the universities in reality, if they're not happy with what University A is doing, they up and move to University B. So University A has 200 researchers who are brought in to work with Company X. Company X decides to move it. You have 200 people on your books that are made redundant, right? So it's a good, it's good opportunity. We in Ireland see it as an opportunity. It's fraught with dangers. The second one is that the companies themselves will drive the research agenda. Second one is, this is what uh, Google, Eric Schmidt, who's CEO of Google said, for, for the smart people on the hill uh, method no longer works. Instead, researchers have become intellectual mercenaries for product teams. They're there to solve immediate needs. There's two problems with that, okay? The first one, which is really a challenge, is when we do research that we need to understand the impact of that research and uh, we need to understand the marketplace as well as being scientists. And I have no problem with that. In fact, I think it's a good idea to have a knowledge, if you're like me, in an engineering discipline of what the challenges are for, uh, in, in that particular discipline. The second thing is the worrying thing, to solve immediate needs. If you talk to Cisco, for instance, who we work with, Cisco will tell you, truthfully, that they don't look beyond three years, right? Why? Because technology is changing so fast. So we, uh, we have a PhD students on a four-year PhD, small length of time. We're trying to do research in the longer term, and we're dealing with companies who are saying, we're not going to think beyond three years, okay? That's a challenge for us. And 
for research that's a particular challenge. So here we see a changing environment where the risk level for industry is extremely high and there's an opportunity that they bring the research to us as institutes. So now we have to work in, a, in an environment where we graduate PhDs, we have a long-term strategy for research and we're working with companies with a short-term need. And that in itself is a, is, is, is an, a challenge and we have to build new research and innovation ecosystems. The European Union, the Innovation Union is the flagship of Europe. And it's the last sentence that was the driver behind it. We are the old world. And as the old world, we're slowly dying, right? We have a very, very good lifestyle. We all want to be like <coughs> France, working 34 hours a day. But the reality <laughs> is, if you go, sorry, if, if 34 hours a week, uh, some Freudian slips today that are very interesting. Um, the, the, uh, Mind you, the girls have been working 34 hours a day <laughs> trying to get this ready. But the key point is this. If you go and look at the way Asia approaches industry and work, and you look at the way Europe approaches. Now, we have a, we have a solution. We say we act smarter, we work smarter, OK? Well, we don't. And the whole idea of the Innovation Union is connecting all parts of society to be innovative, to create new wealth, to actually put Europe at the forefront again of the world economy. Because if you're not creating wealth, you can't have all the support systems. And the future internet is one of those, and uh, I'm told I've only got two minutes. Uh, so this is the type of environment we're in. The other thing is that, from research, is that service economy is the new economy. And sometimes when we do research, we're still very much thinking about the manufacturing se section of the economy. So when we talk about patents and IP, it's very much in that. But in actual fact, the service economy is the new economy and it's driving uh, research. And the problem with the service economy is that there are linear models, models of research and innovation no longer applicable. So you cannot no longer take research and look at a waterfall model and see how this is going to be a product. In hardware, you can do that, but not in the service world. The service world, the interesting thing about service world is it, it, it needs new relationships. It needs new, um, let's say, uh, uh, basically, you need to bring together different um, uh, skill sets, both marketing, both research, both consumers, et cetera, et cetera. And this will change the way we do research. OK, I'm going to skip that. Um, OK, what does this mean to us in the technological university? Uh, first of all, we need gov new governance models. Greater stakeholder engagement at all levels of institute planning and management. That means that we need industry involved. We need uh, uh, general society involved. We need students involved. We have an emphasis on mobility of staff and students. In order to understand this world, increasingly our staff is going to have to go out and work in industry spend time in industry, spend time in public bodies, bring that in here. The walled garden is no longer a way we can operate. The walls are crumbling, okay? Greater emphasis on e-learning and smart systems. We have, to, we have to bring these more into, into our system. And this is a liberation of the, of, of the teaching process. Unfortunately, some lecturers think that this is an intrusion. It's not. Research and innovation are key to staff upskilling. The debate, and I go back to what Ellen said about the OECD. The OECD <coughs> came to Ireland, was it 2004? Mm. And they came, and I was in here and I remember they, they, they came up with this ridiculous statement that the universities will do blue skies and we'll do applied, as if you can box people into different areas. And then, you know, other people won't do research at all. Research and innovation are key to us being effective academics, and it has to be embedded in everything we do. And then internationalization is the norm, going back to the regional aspect. Our staff profile is international, our student profile is international, and these are the things we need to t take. So I'm going to finish off outside two minutes with an ecosystem. It's just playing out there, and this to me 
is our innovation platform. This is the ecosystem system that we have begun to build in WIT. And what does it tell us? It tells us that we have to more tightly couple the innovation to our learning and to our teaching. So whether it's at, for instance, the undergraduate program and the use of e-learning techniques in the undergraduate program, whether it's in the postgraduate program, the graduate school, the in industry-based master's programs, whether it's to do with entrepreneurship and the training on entrepreneurship, which is part of what we do, and how we link that in the executive training, whether it's engagement with high potential startups or multinationals. We have to build an ecosystem where all of these things coexist and in which we deliver to our community by linking all of these various systems. Thank you very much.